Gana Legends, I hope that you're all having a great week. And it's hump day, so we're all getting over that hump of the working week together. So look, first, I really appreciate you guys being here. And if you'd like to come and join the chaos on the Telegram, come across, that's where the uncensored stuff is, and a bit more she talking, and I think more like involvement in finding out things together. So the link there, come jump across. But as we know, the counteroffensive has started. And I heard a really good thing from a friend of mine who said these offensives, it's a process, not an event. And I think that is very true. There's battles and the war. That this isn't an event. This isn't an afternoon and you break through and clear through there. This is a process. The process started, I believe, a few months ago and we started seeing some probing attacks, uh, crosses into Belgrade, things like this. That's the start of the process. And what we're in now is the breakthrough to try and attempt to break through the Russian lines and move on from there. So... What we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at the maps. We're going to talk about a few different variables in this as well and some uh, all over news too. We do know that bad weather is hitting. So we just see here, and this is you know not the most reliable source, I guess, but it's just Orakiv uh, area and Orakiv is down around here. It's up around the Oblast and it does it is going to get wet over the next couple of days. And there was a video with President Zelensky also saying that the weather is not going to be optimal over the next few days. And we know with armoured movements, with infantry, trench systems, things like this, but particularly tracked vehicles, wheeled heavy armoured vehicles, rain and mud is the absolute enemy of those vehicles. So it is getting wet and this could change how we're seeing movements on the offensive and things from there. Now, a big talk over the past, let's say, five days, has been the armoured vehicle losses. The the Leopard uh, 2A6, the 2A4, and the Leopard 2R. Now, the R is the most important one because that was the engineering type. That's the one that clears um, minefields, train systems, the bloody um, tank traps, things like that. And that's very important. Not yet. It's going to become even more important in the future once we actually see Ukraine reach that first lines of defence. But what we do know is the US has thousands of Bradley. Thousands of Bradleys have been made. Now, the number sits somewhere between four and 6,000. Now, how many are actually serviceable? Well, we don't know. But even if we go 25% of the most conservative number, so let's go 4,000 and 25%, we're still talking a 1,000 vehicles. And there's been about 100 delivered into Ukraine so far. We believe that 16 to 18 uh, have been hit. We're not really sure, but we know that the US has just released another $325 million military aid package to Ukraine that is going to include, it said, 15 Bradleys to replace the ones uh, that were damaged. We know that the crews from that, that we do know that there were uh, casualties and losses from those crews. I've got a moustache hair on this, apologies. But we do know some crews were lost because we are videos that do show those vehicles uh, where they've been mined and shelled and a number of bodies around there too. But we're not sure on how much of the crews were lost. So let's say the majority of crews are still capable and they're fine. They can jump in these new vehicles and go from there. And the reason I bring this up is the um, America's military industrial complex, the amount of stuff the Yanks have is just insane. My favorite meme ever was... Um, the Russians and Chinese are about to see why we don't have healthcare. And I thought that was very funny. But they can continue this stream of things like Bradley's in because Bradley's are an outdated IFV, an infantry fighting vehicle. Now as well, in this $325 million, uh, they're going to be delivering strikers, which are a fighting vehicle, but a wheeled variant, as well as uh, munitions for air defense and overall munitions. And another of other countries are sending uh, 155 artillery shells and things like this on that continual rolling support in through there. Now, another big one in the news, before we just jump into the maps, is that it is absolutely expected that depleted uranium rounds will come from the Biden administration, that they'll be signed off and sent in. And we know the Brits are doing this with the Challenger 2, which we haven't seen the Challenger 2 yet. A lot of people are speculating the Challenger 2 will come into play once the breakthrough through the uh, initial lines is actually done, and then they'll be doing that behind the first line sort of movements around. Now, depleted uranium. I think with this, and when we talk nuclear energy, I'm, personally, I'm a big bloody fan of nuclear energy. 
But it's very easy to doomsday uranium and nuclear. It, it's, it's easy to doomsday this because someone mentions uranium that's in plenty of everyday things in hospitals, in weapon sites, whatever, and then someone will post a photo of Chernobyl or Fukushima, something like this. But the health evidence behind depleted uranium is minimal. Now, as well, I will say the people doing the research into this were also things like Ministry of Defences and other things backed in that. So it's hard to believe those as well, but we don't really have anything solid on what the actual health longevity of depleted uranium is. But I completely get um, people's concerns about that as well. But we know uh, Russia also have depleted uranium rounds as well. And Putin has said in a long interview today, and we're going to go over that, that then Russia will start using those. And I think the concerns come up when people look at, well, Ukraine is a big food bowl. The grain you know, exports a huge amount of the world's grain. What does shooting this stuff around actually do? But the most silly thing I ever saw was um, crews of vehicles hit by depleted uranium uh, could have effect. And I'm like... If you've been hit by a depleted uranium sabo round in your tank going at mark fucking whatever, the uh, uranium is going to be the absolute least of my worries at that point. But but I digress. Looks look have a look, I can't talk. Let's have a look over the maps. Talk about a few movements. Look at some things as we've just got a recent Rybar has come out and some newish updates on some of the other maps. So we're here on the deep state of usual. We have Ukraine in the center, the capital of Kiev. The red areas, areas occupied since 22, and the purple since 14. The green liberated since the beginning of the 22 invasion. We've got Romania, Poland, Belarus, and Russia. And here, of course, is Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk in here. And this is the Zaporanzia Oblast is sitting in here. I'll refer to either region or oblast interchangeably, and that's just my poor language. But here we have a Zaporanzia here. So, we're going to zoom in is onto this region, this Lopkovi, Stepovi, to the west of Orakiv. Now, this is where we're seeing, I guess, the most western push, other than the rumours of crossings of the Dnieper River. But we have, we have seen crossings before. We haven't seen any real successful crossings, but it's still up in the air if that will actually happen, as a, especially as that water level drops. But Let's have a look in this region and see if we've seen any shift. So what we have seen throughout today, being the 13th, is just to the south of Novodorivka. Now, we haven't seen anything around this Lobovki, um stepovi region, but just to the south of Novodorivka, we have seen this is what it looked like at the start of the day, and this is what it looked like about three hours ago when this map updated. It's now 1725, and this updated at 1638, so that Ukrainians have made a push in this region, and it has cleared down to that area there. So we have seen that. Let's then have a look, and I'm in the wrong area, but let's have a look on the ISW at these similar regions. So here we have Lopkovi, Stopovi is in this region as well. So this Novodonolivka that we're speaking of here, that's looking at this uh, right angle turning out to the east. We'll have a look on the ISW, and this shows very different. You can't see it yet, but if we zoom in on this, this is Novodonolivka here. So we see where it turns on this road down here. So just to the south, this is where we are looking. And this area, let's say where this turns and then goes uh, due south again. So this road turns and goes due south. So the ISW is showing right down into this region, what I believe is down into here. So we are seeing a fair bit of change around there. And the deep state is also showing there have been changes there today with that. So let's have a look over some of these regions on the map and see what we're seeing from yesterday till today. So we've got the ISW that I've screenshotted from my own video because I'm an ultimate narcissist because I'm a YouTuber. And let's have a look. Now, what are we seeing? I think this this uh, western side we're seeing is fairly similar. The blue zone, the yellow being the claim control, to me is all looking fairly similar. We have these two humps. I wish I had a further... Um, to the east one, just to show this region in here and see if we've seen any further clearances. And I might do. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, I do, actually. Look at that bloody professional YouTuber who is an idiot. Now, are we seeing 
any significant changes. No, not in here. But what we are seeing is if we just look, so where we're talking about in this region, but if we look to the northeast, have a look here. So we're talking Murney as well, that this is the most recent map and this was only claimed control. So it's been reassessed that Russia is actually in control of this on this most recent map. So this area, yellow, was claimed. Uh, this map's actually about 48 hours ago. ISW didn't update yesterday, but now it's actually saying that Russia has been assessed control there. Now, does that mean that Russia moved up to there? No, it just means that uh, the ISW, things like this, had then geolocated footage, say, in Murni or Zahirini, and to say, actually, yes, they are in that position. But to my eye, these bits in here haven't changed over the last couple of days. But we have seen a slight change there. Now, this region around Murni, now, this is showing similar to what we're seeing in uh, the ISW, that this is still in Russian control. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to keep going to the east, and we're going to have a look around this region. Now, this is where everyone is talking. So we're between Novodonetsky and Lavadny in this region, and where we're talking is, is Makarivka. Now, Makarivka has been the talk of the last 24 hours of what is going on? We know that Ukraine got it and then Russia counterattacked and got it back and it's gone to and from. But at the end of today, it is said that Ukraine is in control and there's been geolocated images that they are in Makarivka here. So let's have a look at where this lay 48 hours ago and where it shows now. So I believe on the east is showing pretty much uh, the same, although maybe just pushed in a little bit more on this crossroad here, that yes, to the east there has been a further push in around here, but it is showing now of what we saw on uh, the I, uh, sorry, the Rybar sources, the Rybar Russian sources were saying that this region, this sort of bubble here that ran out through here, had been cut off, and now that has been updated to show that as well. And this will show Uruzani still under uh, Russian control, although that has been spoken of where that actually lies uh, at the moment. We know that is important. So let's have a look at the deep state and see what this is showing here as we can scroll through the changes. So what we will see is from the 12th when I talked to you yesterday and then through uh, to earlier today, so at 0100, we see that Ukraine made this push into Makarivka, and then at the end of the day, it said that you are uh, showing, oh my God, sorry, it's showing that Russia counterattack up into here, and that's where it's settled for the day. So you can see these changes. Now, let's just zoom out on this and have a look at some other maps that show the same region. So let's then look at the war mapper. And the war mapper is very conservative, but uh, does definitely take their time in showing what they then show. So this is the 13th of the 6th, so today. So it is still showing grey zone all through Zani. Blahadny as well is still in this under Russian control. And that is interesting to myself. For this store of Zevi in here, they're still saying that this is grey zone through here. So the war mapper isn't showing what some of the other maps are showing. But the reason we do this is to get an idea of what the different maps are saying and showing and then go from there. So I think the most interesting of all these maps over the past couple of days have been the Rybar Russian sources. Let's have a look and see what then this is saying. And this working from the west to the east is showing a fair bit of a cut in. So it is showing this sort of cut down here, which is this cut. But of course, uh, my zoom ins are different to try and still get the um, the scale's going to be off. But if you zoom out any more on the ISW, then you lose the names of things. But then we have Levadny in here. And what this is showing on the Rybar, and I have to say, Rybar is showing a lot more gains from the Ukrainian side. So we have a Levadny in here, and this Prituni in here, and I would have pronounced this incorrectly, but that is basically cutting all the way down into here. And what we're going to take is this reservoir here, which I believe is this reservoir, and we can see that it is cutting further down into here. So showing that Ukraine had a major advance over the past 24 hours in this region. And we'll compare the two maps in a sec. Now we're going to zoom in to the central bit, but we have then a zoomed in area here. So this is the zoomed in bit. So this is where then we're talking. So what we need to take note of is Makarivka in here, and this is Makarivka. Now it is showing at the end of the day that Makarivka is under control of then uh, the Ukrainian side that that has been taken. You can see sort of see the dark blue in here. The dark blue is saying that that came under control, but that there are counteroffensives from there. And what's it then saying out in Novodonetsky region? To my eye, 
it is showing fairly similar uh, if we take the claimed control as the border in and around where this region is here. And I think that's showing fairly similar on the deep state as well. So I think those uh, dif slight differences we see are uh, very interesting to then talk about. So if we zoom out of this, what we are then going to pop up is we're going to again then get the uh, 12th of June up as well. So, of course, yesterday's is on the left. Today's will be then on the right. So what we see is around Levadny. Let's have a look at how much uh, that the Ukrainian side actually cleared in through here. But, of course, this arrow is showing that there is then a counterattack on that. And we know that when Ukraine gets somewhere, uh, Russia counterattack it and then goes from there. And we need to speak of as well. And if you look with any of my interviews with some of the foreign fighters, they talk in depth about this, especially in the most recent one where he's saying a lot of the Russians don't want to fight in the urban conflict in there, that they'll see you, mate, they'll see you coming into the village, they'll then pull out and they'll just artillery the shit out of it, that that's how they want to fight because we know that uh, Russia has massive artillery um, systems, massive artillery overmatch as well, at least in uh, quantity as well. So they will tend to pull out and then scorched earth method that region. We've seen this happen again and again. So this is where we see this fluidity moving to and from, but we've seen in this region. And then as well down, if we have the zoom in on the left of yesterday, zoom in on the right of today, we do see this region then cleared, but massive ins and outs. And here we can see where they pull back and then pushed forward as well. Now, what are we seeing in the eastern district of this? To my eye, no real significant change, if any, on the east. But we know this middle bit here to what I'm reading and what I'm reporting is definitely the most uh, fierce amount of fighting going on. Now, what we always do to have a look at, and you might be sick of me doing this, but I always want to break things down. So this we're talking of Velika Novosilka. Now, what we need to look at, where actually are the... Um, Front line, although not the front lines, the actual built-in, like concreted defensive positions where we're going to see the real fight come through. The fight now is still just getting to that. This is why we haven't seen all the equipment, everything come in, is because they still need to achieve not just working through these villages, but they need to achieve then this breakthrough. And people are talking about tactical reserves, strategic reserves coming into play uh, from the Russians. And I'm not saying that Russia isn't sending in troops to, you know, bolster some supporter and Makarivka, uh, Staromolsky in this region. I'm not saying they're doing that. But I don't think you'll see the full amount of these reserves until we reach... Uh, these real defensive lines and that's going to be on both sides they're not going to commit everything until there's that achieve until they've got to the line and then to achieve the breakthrough of this line so this uh, Velika Novosilka is here on this map and this is where we're talking so I actually did a map of this today and we're talking about 10 kilometers six miles between where we're going to then see um it was the first positions here. So this is Makarivka, where we've come through, and people are saying the main real town to break through is then going to be this Stara Malyonsky, and I, that is pronounced horrifically, I apologise. But from Makarivka, then we see there's still about 10 kilometres then to get through to this main line. But where we're seeing they're attacking in this direction, we zoom out and we see that this is one of the least defended, at least by looking on a map like this that shows the defensive works. And what you can do is you can actually click on these bubbles and then it will take you to the uh, photo they use to actually say what's there. So it's a, a satellite image and there's the trench system and that's how this works. So these are all geolocated, all these dots on this. But you can actually see that there is significantly less ground here as where we talk about in Otto Kiev, if we were to talk about a breakthrough here, look at the amount of defence there's going to have to come down into uh, Melitopol. But if you break through here and you're in this region back here, then you have that freedom of movement to move around behind the lines and doing uh, assaults like that. So that is interesting, but they haven't yet reached the full uh, actual line of this. And just to actually line this up even further for you, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in and let's say that they are in then Makarivka here, and the and Remivka is where the first line is, but to the southwest. Let's have a look if we can find that Remivka. Here it is. So let's go from 
just in line with this to this position. So 7.4 kilometers around about. So if we go out here, we're talking more of the 10, but that's where we're going to see a big battle to get through and then push through these defensive works. And we will see, you know, Russia pull back in delaying and then massive artillery. We'll also see Russia laying many, many mines in this region up to these spots. And they can also, lines aren't, mines aren't just made by someone putting in the ground. You can lay mines by artillery as well. And both sides have this ability to do it. So it is a big thing we're going to see continue on. But digressing back then to the maps, let's continue on this region before we move uh, to the where, uh, so to the east and northeast. So this is the war mapper version of basically this southern region. So it's showing this greater. I think this is interesting. So we've talked about these individual areas, but let's have a look at where he assesses that then the pushes are. So this is Lopkovi. Uh, in this region down to the southwest of Orokiv, where we spoke about first. And this is where we spoke about second, this Blahadny Makarivka area, and then Huliopol, which is Marfapil. Now, we spoke about Marfapil, and I've had a look at the maps, and there hasn't been any uh, ingression and gains in that region, but we spoke that there was reports of that as well. And down due south of Orokiv is where we've seen today, in this to the south of Novod, uh, Novodanilivka, we saw this push. So this is where these are all showing on here, which I think is very interesting as well, just to get an overlay of where the arrows actually lie on this. So where are we going to go to next? Everyone's favourite, Bakhmut. So let's go up to Bakhmut first on the deep state map, because that'll be the quickest way to get there. And what have we seen over the past couple of days? What we have seen is then this pullback. Now, we did notice this yesterday on the ISW that this in the south, now there hasn't been any changes in north or east, but this south down around this canal has had a major pullback into this position. Now, let's then have a look on the ISW, zoom in on this, and we saw this yesterday on the ISW. We are seeing the same from 48 hours ago to what we are seeing Day. I think the maps, that's, I think, maybe comprehensively enough for today. And we haven't really seen any other changes to and from. But I think it is interesting to look at where these initial assaults are and then where these defensive lines actually are uh, actually the real, the real battle in this overall war is going to be this. But like I said in the beginning, that this is a process, not a um, not an event. It's not done in an afternoon. And there'll be a process too of breaking into this line. And if they get through it, then to regroup, refit, stabilise flanks, and then go from there. We'll see this in many stages. And I know that military planning then would have multiple stages of attack. And as well as what happens if this goes wrong, what happens if we don't break through? What is um, the most dangerous course of action? What is the uh, least dangerous course of action? And all these other actions on of, well, if they cut us off here, what do we do there? So, it's very interesting, but it does look like there's a push down to Berdyansk or Mariupol through there, which if you look from a smooth brain like myself, this looks like the area to do it. But I haven't gone into the complete assessment of the topography here too, because if it is some um, topography as far as you need less positions to cover more ground, well, that could be an issue as well. And we do know that there are many sources claiming that Russia is pulling a lot of guys out of this, out of the Kherson region to reinforce in this area as this area is fairly flooded at the moment. So I think that is maybe enough of the maps. Let's read the MOD update today before we talk about a few things. And as well, we get to have the Brits rename a drone to something far more uh, complex. In recent months, Russia has highly likely worked to ensure its long-term high-volume supply of one-way attack uncrewed aerial vehicles, OWA UAVs. It sounds like I'm saying ooh, ooh like one of those e-girls, but a drone. Uh, but a kamikaze drone, so not to and from. By supplying these weapons, Iran continues to breach UN Security Council Resolution 2231. Now, do Iran or Russia give a shit about that? Especially Iran. They could not care less. Iran has been sanctioned for a bloody long time. Went from one of America's most trusted countries to the state where it is today. So, the history of that is very, uh, very complex and very interesting. I've actually done a full video on that if you are interested in how that sort of went. But 
Russia has likely moved from receiving small deliveries of Iranian drones by air transport to larger consignments by ship from Iran via the Caspian Sea. This international north-south transit corridor has assumed much more importance since the invasion. It allows Russia to access Asian markets, including arms transfers, in ways it hopes are less valuable to international sanctions. Russia is also working to start domestic production of drones, also certainly with Iranian assistance. Russia is highly likely investing in drones because it provides Russia with a relatively cheap long-range strike capability at a time when it has expended a large proportion of its cruise missile stocks in Ukraine. Now, cruise missile stocks, how many have they got left? Well, in the first month of the war, people would have been saying that they have used 90 Five percent, and then six months after that, we're at ninety percent. So we don't really know how many cruise missiles and what the replacement are of this. But cruise missiles are very, very expensive, and as we can see, can be shot down. Now the drones can be shot down as well, but significantly less. Now the price of some of these drones is about twenty thousand dollars, and of course, to intercept that costs a lot more money. And the components can be fairly cheap and easy too. If you looked at a breakdown of these drones, you can make them basically out of off-the-shelf parts. It doesn't need anything special. And all those sanctions have hit Russia. Like Apple stores are still open. Electronic stores are still open. Access to Asian markets is still open. Yeah, Russia may not be able to build a, I don't know, a, an F-22 or a state-of-the-art thermal site. But to build something like this, to build missiles, to build, to resupply parts, absolutely can still do that because so many um, there's so many ways to get around the sanctions. There's a few vloggers who walk around Moscow and just show you shopping centers. And oh look, here's an iPhone 14 Pro, whatever the newest one is. So I think that is interesting to talk about in that way as well. Now, some interesting things today, and I'm going to read this just off the New York Times that this came out from the Wall Street Journal. We know the Wall Street Journal, um, of course, behind a paywall, and I'm a tight ass, but uh, has talked about Nord Stream more and more, and this is a bit of a fucking no shit, but we had releases last week that, you know, the CIA had, you know, some sort of tip-offs from Europe officials too, and then there's been more of this release too. So we're just going to go over this in the worst... Um, thing of my journalism ever, but CIA told Ukraine last summer it should not attack the Nord Stream. So Dutch officials shared with the CIA in June that Ukraine had a plan to then send divers to blow up then the pipelines. Now the CIA told officials last summer it had learned of what it thought to be an aborted plot by the Ukrainians to attack Nord Stream pipeline and reinforced their objection to the operations. So the US officials are saying, we object you doing that. We don't want you doing this. And something interesting about some of the information coming out about this was Zeluzny, being the chief of the defense, did it separate from Zelensky. So the most important thing for Zelensky, and you could argue one of the most important things for Ukraine, is to maintain the optics they have currently of um, peace, democracy, being the good guys, you know, things like that, defending the border. So Zelensky needs to lean into that as well. So this was done, apparently, Zelensky had no idea this happened, and it was run directly under Zeluzny. Because if Zeluzny had something happen, well... It, it, not as many people know who he is as who Zelensky is, but Dutch officials shared information with the CIA that had learned Ukrainian military had been planning operations to send divers and the tip off from there. And American officials now believe the operation was not aborted, but delayed potentially with different Ukraine-aligned group carrying out the attack. Now, we do know that this attack caused a insane ecological disaster that no one talks about with how much actually escaped from there. Yes, gas wasn't pumping through those at the time, but they still had to be pressurised from there. So then everything came out, caused a massive disaster. But like I spoke about, sorry, just before, I forgot to mention something, between Zelensky and Zelensky, it gives that degree of separation to and deniability as well. I think this is fairly obvious, but this isn't just a dive that you or me, being recreational divers, we go down to Paddy or... SDI or SSI, or the other one is called, get our open water ticket and jump in and blow up. This is not that. You look at the depth of water, you look at even the uh, finding it in the water, the navigation, the, the cold of the water, carrying that much gear. This is done by a professional outfit for sure. Now, we're going to look over a few interviews as well. So here we have uh, Gosian has been talking as well about the offensive, and the offensive is everything. So we're going to look at uh, everything in the media. We're going to talk about um, Prigozhin, and we're going to actually look over the Putin interview as well. So in a few words, what is happening? The happening is Ukrainians have begun an offensive, which we know. The, uh, with the offensive, they do everything competently. 
Now, we have spoken that Prigozhin in this, he he really does speak his mind. He's calling out officials. He has, again, many times uh, praised Ukraine on their efforts too. And uh, particularly in Bakhmut, we know that that had a, a double edge effect, that by praising the Ukrainians, in which he you know won that, Battle of, of Bakhmut, then it, they can show that, well, look, we're fighting against this NATO standard force and we still won. So he, of course, is leaning into that propaganda. But then he's also, in things like this, speaking about the competency of Ukraine as well and the cutting off certain areas in the Zaporanziat direction, which is where we just spoke about. Meanwhile, they're covering the left flank right for us and left for them. So the left flank is being covered and of course, giving it's on there, then their right flank, exactly where the battles are taking place. Now, is Rosani, where we've spoken of, which is just to the south of Makovinka as well, and so on. They're covering the left flank, the area they managed to take as of today. They evaluate 100 square kilometers. Now, I've heard much uh, less uh, than that as well, but that is what he's saying. So if you're coming straight down on this, then your left flank is going to be over here. So he's saying that they're covering covering that as they are moving down uh, to the south through Makarivka and then Uzani, which sits down here as well. So that 100 square kilometers. And in my calculations, it is even a bit more. So Prokosian is saying it's more. They're moving carefully, calmly, and have lost a few leopards and a few Bradleys. But these are normal combat losses like we've talked about. I'm not saying this is to promote them, but to judge sensibly. So it is early So it's early to celebrate. We need to mobilize and get together. We have seen Prokosian say that more, they need more troops. They need to spin up this. And he even says that they needed to do it six months ago. So we had these guys now, because if they do it now, it's still going to be six months. Like we speak about with the F-18s, F-16s, and whatever from there, that, well, if you do it now, it's too late for this offensive. It's too late for the next six, seven months. You should have done it seven months ago. Anyway, they understand they will not stop until they either get beaten or get some sort of positive result. From now, in my view, according to the valuation of the military on the ground, what is enough is being done to counter the enemy. So he said that you know Ukraine will not stop until they have success through here. And we know that they're either going to get beaten or have success. And we know that Ukraine is not willing to have any compromises at all. They've made that very, very clear that there's going to be no compromises. And as well, that this could then have dire outcomes for either Ukraine or Russia, that this is where I've said that by the end of this war, we're going to have a million people dead, because either way this goes, if Ukraine is not willing to compromise an inch of land, then if Russia to succeed in what they want to succeed, then have to clear all the way to Lviv, and they're going to have to take huge casualties and inflict huge casualties. And the vice versa, that if Russia is not willing to pull back and... Um, make any negotiations and neither is Ukraine, they're going to have to fight for every square inch. Well, there's going to be huge losses through here and we know that neither side want to really negotiate or do anything. And either, although Russia throws out negotiation, Ukraine will say the only negotiation they'll do is back to this border down here, which is, of course, their um, post-91 uh, Soviet border. So with that, then let's have a look of Putin's complete interview. So... There's translated bits you'll see online, but the people that share these, either being the pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian accounts, share just snippets, you know, a 30-second clip that will um, paint it in one way. Now, if you ever want to look over one of, um, what's his name, complete um, speeches, interviews, whatever, and they've got all of them, you can actually go on the Kremlin.ru website, which... I'm not bloody promoting, but you can go on there and it's actually got it transcribed into English. You can actually go through this as well. Just if you want to know, because if it says something, you know, well, what did he say before or after that? You can have a look on that. And I actually think there are some fairly hard questions asked in this. So, but I'm not, of course, things like this you could say are scripted, whatever. I don't know completely how this goes down, but we know that Russia has a very low freedom of press as well. So take it with a grain of salt. But I think some of this is interesting. So this guy, Yevgeny Putabini says the special military operation has lasted a fairly long time. The situation is changing, the position is changing, and probably the goals and tasks of the SMO are changing as well. Can you tell us how they have changed at all? Putin says, no, they are changing in accordance with the current situation. So they are changing. But I find it interesting he said that he's going as a fairly long time. But of course, overall, they are not changing anything. Our goals are fundamental to us. And of then he speaks of that these guys have all been under fire and his experiences as well and what is going on with the acceptance of the um, 
revelations of what is then happening. And this is a incredibly long answer. But as you know, I've already said, no secret here, we did offer every option to our Western partners, as I used to call them. We thought we were one of them. We wanted to be in the family of so-called civilized nations. I reached out to NATO, suggesting that we look into that possibility, but we were quickly shown the door. They didn't even bother to consider it. I also suggested creating a shared missile defense system. We're aware in the events of the 1990s and early 2000s stem from the bitter historical legacy in the Caucasus, for instance. Who were they fighting there? Mostly Al-Qaeda. And what did our partners do? They supported them by providing financial, informational and political and even military support. Have a look. Have a look into this. Go and have a look at the history of Al-Qaeda and have a look at the CIA's influence on Al-Qaeda and the proxy as well in Afghanistan with the Russians um, feeding in money and the Americans into Al-Qaeda and how that spiralled into then what guys like me were like, hang on, what the fuck? Anyway, and this one's from Dmitry Gorka. Now, I have actually highlighted some of this, and I'm skipping a lot, but it's very easy to find this. Ukraine's counteroffensive is underway. You provide your comment on the situation five days into the counteroffensive. Some time has passed since then. You receive operational updates every day, and as we can see, not only from the Special Military Operations Command, but you make direct phone calls with the front line as well. Is there anything you can add to your previous assessments? Yes, this is a large-scale counteroffensive which uses, as I said recently publicly, reserves that had been stockpiled to this end. It started on the 4th of June and continues to this day and right now as we speak. And this continues on and then talks about some losses. And of course, all losses. I don't care which side, who's talking losses, except if it's Oryx with photo of this tank. Don't believe it. But the situation is even more serious with armor. During this period, they lost 160 tanks to they, Ukraine, and more than 360 armored vehicles of different types. And this isn't backed up by um, the photos and videos, although we do know a lot of vehicles were lost. This is only what we are seeing. There are losses that we do not see. They are inflicted by long-range precision weapons at masses of personnel and equipment. So this is something as well spoken that a lot of the losses we um, see that we have proof of through Oryx are on the front and being released photos of this. But we do know that, you know, yes, um, Russia's missiles do hit some random targets occasionally. Some of them would hit, and there would be loss of personnel and equipment well behind the line. Now, when I was in uh, Lviv very early on in this war, there was uh, an attack on a uh, base that said to have killed about 30 people. And I was speaking to a guy who was mobilised, and he said it was significantly more than that. So we know there are things from there. But he says, in reality, Ukraine has sustained heavier losses. By my calculation, their losses are 25 or maybe 30% of the equipment supplied from abroad. It seems to me that would agree with this if they count objectively. But as far as I know from Western sources, it seems that this is what they say. So uh, as for our losses, the Ministry of Defence talk and about other indicators and personnel, I said lost over 160 tanks and we lost 54 tanks, some of which can be restored and repaired. And a lot of people are pointing out that he's just done the 30% that, you know, you would some, it's sort of wrong people will pull this out of military doctrine that a defending force can defend with about a third of the offensive force, but that doesn't clearly indicate that you will take a third the losses just because that's what doctrine says doctrinally that is uh, it's for like small infantry operations not when you're including tanks and air and superiority because on the other side well then if the defensive goes you can from from a 30 percent force to losing a hundred percent so if that makes sense now Speaking of the Novokovka hydroelectric plant, the dam, the blow up, um, the tragedy has occurred. Who is to blame for this, in your opinion? Will they be punished? And a third question, what assistance can people uh, from the affected areas, sorry, affected areas expect? Uh, I'm not going to say things that I'm not 100% sure of, but by and large, we do not record any big explosion just before the destruction. At any rate, this is what is reported to me. And they have targeted the Kovka um, power plant with high Mars many times. We do know that there was an article from eight months ago that did talk of, you know, high Mars, what the ability would actually be to hit that dam as well. And that was released through Western sources. That's the whole point. Maybe they place munitions there. I don't know right now. Or maybe they undermine the structure with something minor and trigger the break. And we do not know. that We do not have solid 100% evidence exactly of what happened here. And that probably won't ever come out. Whether the Russians blew it up, the Ukrainians blew it up, or it was just a really bad circumstantial um, and 
bad timing that then that went through there. But what we do know is the effect of thousands, tens of thousands of people have been severely affected by this. Now the second point. Unfortunately, I'll say a strange thing now, but nevertheless, this unfortunately ruined their counteroffensive in this direction. Why, unfortunately? Because it would have been better for us if they had launched their offensive there. Better for us because we would have been in a bad offensive position for them. But that didn't happen because of their flooding. So in this talking that this was the ground that was massively built up by the Russians, but could have been crossed from her son as well um, from the Ukrainians. So... It is very interesting that it would have been better for us if they had launched their offensive there. And this is why people are saying that there's evidence. They're saying that Russia did it. And this is interesting too about the actions in the rear, um, about the enemy actions behind the line, that are there weak pass without news of drones or either hit or hitting infrastructure facilities? Surely there is an acute issue regarding the border area, especially in Belgorod region. My question literally goes like this. How does it happen that enemy drones reach the Kremlin? And having started to liberate Donbass, why are we now forced to evacuate our population from border areas, which are already entered by Polish mercenaries and Polish language is heard on our territories? And then Putin backs up the Polish mercenaries were fighting there and that you're right, he agrees that they are suffering loss anyway. He continues. Um, secondly, concerning the drones, you probably know that our colleagues also know at one time we had a situation in the Kremlin when drones flew in and unfortunately dropped several grenades and we lost personnel there. But we rather quickly learned how to deal with this by various means. Apparently the same is true here. Our relevant agencies need to make the necessary decisions because of traditional air defence systems. It's calibrated for missiles, aircraft, uh, for missiles and large aircraft and not the drones. But he says that they have then been calibrated for this. But for the border areas, there is a problem and it's connected. I think you understand this too, mainly with the desire to divert our forces and resources to this site, to withdraw part of the units from those areas that are considered the most important and critical from the point of view of the possible offensive by the armed forces of Ukraine. We do not need to do this, but of course we must protect our citizens. So, this is, and I'm of the opinion of this, so these cross-border operations are one part of asymmetrical warfare, but also in part to then try to attempt to draw more Russian forces away. And we have seen that. We have seen that there has been now or allegedly Chechens, Katarov's Chechens deployed in that region. So, of course, they're not going to be part of this counteroffensive movement, and that is clever in there. And then it does speak of as well with then... The special service agents are working openly on our territory, openly in the sense not even denying that they are hunting leaders of public opinion in Russia. As well, they have very tough counter, and this is from Putin, very tough counterintelligence regime, martial law. I don't think we need to do that now. We just need to improve and expand the work of law enforcement and agency and special services. And we knew, again, another guy who worked in uh, the ministry in uh, the Kremlin as well had been murdered and found in his own basement only in the past maybe 48 hours. So there are, you know, agents working far behind the line and partisans and that asymmetrical warfare is incredibly hard to actually police and stop from there. And both uh, the West and Russia have fought asymmetrical warfare like this before. We fought the Taliban, they fought in Chechnya, they fought in Grozny, in Afghanistan as well, that that is very difficult. They lost in Afghanistan and so did we against a far lesser force and of course asymmetrical warfare. So I know people go, you're, you're pulling out bits of boot, but I think it is still important to look at this, read through this, read what was actually said and then break that down from there. Now this video is dragging. I was going to talk about this um, piece from Jordan Peterson as well that really stirred a lot of conversation from people and 50% hated it, 50% liked it and some really smart conversation in that too. But I think I'll get copyright striked if I do that also. But I thought that was interesting. You can see that on my Telegram and I think there's like 500 comments and some really really intelligent breakdown for some people like some fantastic work being done breaking down bits and pieces and rights and wrongs of what he mentions. So I'm really impressed with some people in that. So Legends, that is it from me today. I know this one's been a lot longer and a lot of shit talk for myself, but thank you for being here. If you'd like to support me, links down below, but never ever feel obliged. I appreciate the hell of you guys getting to this portion of the view. So look after yourselves and I'll speak to you tomorrow. Cheers. Bye-bye.